energy, New Delhi. Prayer is the most powerful form of energy one can generate. It, su it supplies us with the flow of sustaining power in our daily lives, says Alexis Carroll. To begin this auspicious knowledge day, may I, now, may I now invite Ms. Jay Ranjani of 2nd MSc Botany to invoke Almighty's blessings through prayer song. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons of rushing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessings we There shall be shores of blessing, breezes reviving again over the hills and the valleys. Sound up of wonders of rain, shores of blessing, shores of blessings we Thank you, Ms. Jayaranjani. It is a great day, one we have been planning and waiting for. Now I request our high chodi, Dr. M. Glory, head and associate professor of botany, to welcome the gathering. Distinguished resource person, Reverend Sister Principal, Reverend Sisters, erudite professors, researchers, deans, heads of various departments, great participants from India and from different parts of the world. Very good morning. As we get united in this significant academic virtual platform to deliberate on climate change and future challenges, I, Dr. M. Glory, am singularly privileged to extend warm greetings on behalf of the Department of Botany. In fact, it is gratifying to have participants world over attending a conference in Tutukudi of the state of Tamil Nadu in the southernmost tip of India. I would like to happily note that this coastal town is also known as Pearl City, is a fisheries, industrial and port hub in this semi-urban region with its centuries of cultural, religious and commercial diversity stands our prestigious 74-year-old institution, St. Mary's College, an educational institution run by the Savoy Sisters for Women. It has shaped thousands of young women, providing liberative education. In this lush academic ambience, with magnificent infrastructure functions, the Botany Department. Since its inception in 1957, the department has built high credential in knowledge dispensation and promotion of research. The department is now known for a noteworthy rooted record of eminent professors in the past decades and at the present. The trailblazing active trajectory for research and expertise in botany continues full fledged even today. And this conference is an instance when we come to the main theme of our forum, climate change is a climate change. Several scientists, several scientific forums and consensus have been executed to discuss the same. Some are skeptic of destructive climate change. Others are strong proponents of drastic climate change. Today, 97% of the climate change scientists 
around the world accepted unprecedented climate change climate change is a real they accept it it is a real if it is a real there are so many questions arise who are the reason for the climate change what are the main threats of climate change how climate change threatens farm and food security why we must urgently act on climate change what happen if we do nothing to stop climate change what can i and you do to stop the climate change to you answer to these questions there are scientists from different parts of the world connected with us who deliberate broadly on various issues related to climate change to deliver the keynote of the main team with us is now dr j shri a great scholar and researcher who has accepted our invitation in spite of her hectic schedule this is my great opportunity to introduce her to this scientific forum dr j shri is a multifaceted and multilinguistic personality right from the beginning she was a shrewd student achieved several meritorious award in her schooling and in her higher education her enriched academic qualification coupled with her research temper helped her to complete phd in biodiversity and biotechnology in 1987 quick in action she has started her career in 1988 as research assistant in national institute of rural development hyderabad and sv university tirupati in following her wide knowledge and social endeavors inspired her, her to serve as a research fellow in indian institute of science in 2008 she has been promoted as managing trustee of the organization care earth her environmental consciousness and love towards the mother earth spurred her to undergo many projects and assignments pertaining to biological diversity and conservation uh, through uh, this she authored 42 technical reports on biodiversity for tamil nadu the uh, government of india she is the champion and collaborator to the global Co- entrepreneurship summit supported by us consulate she accomplished successfully multi country projects like monsoon assemblages funded by european research council she has co-authored many research manuals her experience in several government bodies helped her to achieve various professional accomplishments she has been served as a project director project leader research advisor principal principal investigator co investigator consultant and a researcher under the major themes of water resource sub management restoration ecology policy research training and capacity building etc her tenacity in extending helping hands made her to become the member of social uh, several board of board boards Uh, such as sub committee on agriculture confederation of indian industry uh, i i mention only few national executive of indian association of women studies and united nations cb and ad hoc committee on access and benefit uh, etc i mentioned only few she uh, her uh, thing is a volume uh, resume is a volume in short many of her projects works and research findings were fruited into full length research articles 32 research articles she published in various uh, journals with high impact value acknowledge her research contribution and her research accomplishment certainly we are we are very fortunate to have such an eminent and most relevant person to deliver the keynote address on behalf of the department of botany and management and all the great participants i extend a genial welcome to you ma'am Thank I'm you, delighted. Ma'am. I'm delighted to welcome our beloved principal, Dr. S. Uh, Lucia Rose, whose meticulous planning and articulation always steer our institution towards excellence. Hearty welcome to you, sister. It's my pleasure to welcome our secretary, Reverend Sister Flora Mary, who is all times of whose all times support and silent contribution always motivating us to accomplish. a uh, task of any dimension uh, my special welcome goes to uh, our deputy principal dr sister kulandi teras dean's controller of examination heads of various departments and my uh, colleagues 
in our department. Uh, it's my duty to welcome all the participants, without whom the intention of this forum would not be successful. Cordial welcome to all the participants. I hope this conference would be more vibrant and purposeful and will create more impact and awareness on protection, protecting our mother, Earth, our blue planet. Thank you so much for the opportunity done. Thank you. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to all the all of them connected here. Thank you, ma'am, for the great introduction and warm words of welcome. Now, with much honor, I would like to invite our beloved principal, Reverend Dr. Sister A.S. J. Lucia Rose, to felicitate the international webinar. Renowned resource person, Dr. Jayashree Vengadeshan, Managing Trustee, Care Yet Trust, Chennai, Reverend Sister Flora Media Secretary, Reverend Sister Kulande Teres, Deputy Principal, Reverend Sister Josephine Jairani, Director of Self-Supporting Courses, Dr. Punita Dharani, Controller of Examinations, Dr. Sister Arukya Genesis Alphonse, Overall Coordinator and Member Secretary, Department of Biotechnology, Star College Program, Leonard Faculty Members from our institution and from other institutions, Research Scholars and my dear students. A very pleasant morning to one and all connected here. I'm very much delighted to welcome you all to this international webinar on Climate Change and Future Challenges, sponsored by DBT New Delhi and organized by Marian Star Center, Department of Botany, St. Mary's College Autonomous Tutukudi, and a Star College program. The topic chosen for this international webinar is an opt topic for the current scenario. First of all, I would like to congratulate the convener, Dr. Glory, Head and Associate Professor of Botany, and the organizing committee members for their strenuous efforts in organizing this international webinar. I wish and hope that this webinar will be beneficial to all the participants who have joined here with much enthusiasm. Climate change is a long-term shift in temperature and weather pattern. Though it is a natural phenomenon, since industrialization, it is more rapid and more intense due to ruthless anthropogenic activities. Some recent extremes, such as heat waves, severe drought, floods, storms, and sea level rise would, have, would not have happened without the human influences on the Earth system. Scientific observation and predictions warn that, warn that the climate changes are widespread and the hazards it causes is more frequent and re reflect the magnitude of collective challenges for all the stakeholders in the world. It is shocked to hear that the reports of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change dated 28th February 2022 indicated that the climate changes change the climate changes are far greater, more frequent, and vastly more disruptive than we understand now. They, in turn, disclose the fact that the rise in 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature would cause multiple climate change risk. Climate change, along with non-climate change havoc, resulting in compounding overall risk and risk cascading across several sectors and regions of the Earth. So it is the high time to address the impact of climate change and all forms of its ecosystem. I hope this is the right moment to seize the opportunity to work with the understanding of scientific evidences for translating into realities of climate change action. At this juncture, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the resource persons for accepting our invitations and to deliver talks on various topics amidst their busy schedule. Once again, I appreciate and applaud the organizers for their sincere efforts in organizing this international webinar. I wish, you all, I wish all the participants to make the best use of this unique opportunity. I wish this international webinar a great success. God bless you all.
thank you sister for your blessing blessings and wishes which adds more positive vibration within us dear participants i kindly request you all to turn on your cameras for the photo session thank you all <clears throat> the most valuable resource that all teachers have is each other without collaboration our growth is limited to our perspective says robert john now without further ado let me turn the time over to our resource person dr jayshri venkateshan to share the keynote address on the topic climate change and warming planet over to you ma'am thank you very much am i audible yes ma'am yes ma'am we can hear you thank you thank you so much good morning respected uh, senior management of st mary's college faculty dear students and fellow speakers researchers ladies and gentlemen it's certainly a privilege to be talking to you and i hope to do justice to whatever i have been asked to do but let me begin with the rider i am not going to stick to a conventional mode of a keynote address in the sense talk about climate change and the scientific aspects of it and what are the projections and stuff like that i am instead going to use this opportunity to try to motivate the younger students who are there the young students who are present in the audience and in doing so i may be talking a bit like about things that may seem irrelevant but please bear with me i will try to connect all of that up at the end of the lecture to tell you how each action is actually pertinent to climate change now to begin with climate change is not something new it was introduced to this world along with two other conventions the convention on biological diversity and the convention on desertification way back in 1992 on june 5th a day that we now commemorate as world environment day in rio de janeiro in what came to be called as the earth summit but after that what typified the discussions the debates the action on climate change was largely a kind of a rejection you know although there were people in fact some of them are also present in this particular meeting who championed the cause of it and who tried to do their best the world was actually typified by not just ignorance but also a rejection rejection largely stemming out of the fact because the onus was on human beings as a species to do good climate change is one aspect one convention which actually clearly demonstrated how human action especially cumulative human action has contributed to this kind of a scenario where we are not very sure about what's going to happen so as soon as the fingers were pointed at our own selves there was a sense of rejection there were a lot of efforts to derail the process so this derailment is what actually contributed to climate change not really achieving the focus on climate change not getting enough and the kind of achievements that were set out not being realized so this is how the entire scenario actually began what summarizes this rejection is actually a book a novel by a very well known author called michael crichton and this is a book called the state of fear if any of you have an opportunity to read it i would suggest you read it because this is anchored or this is constructed as a highly scientific well very well researched kind of a novel which says climate change is nothing but a bogey which has been erected by the global community to make sure that every decade there is something of a scare that needs to come into people and that's what keeps the funding mechanism going it, it's actually a, a novel based on conspiracy theory you would be surprised to know that just as there are so many of us who believe that climate change is real and that we are all experiencing already experiencing it big time there is an equal number which says this is a conspiracy i think it's important that you read the conspiracy part of it also to understand how far away from truth they are and how sometimes even the most real and pressing issues get rejected it is in that context that i'm say, suggesting or recommending that we read this book the state of fear because it talks about things with a lot of references and when you actually google those references they do exist so it's in that sense a very very well researched conspiracy theory book which i, I would recommend that you read 
Now, what is climate change? Something that sister so beautifully explained and what are the kinds of various parameters by which climate change is being talked about is also something that she mentioned. So I will not repeat that. But instead say that what climate change means to me as a person, to you as an individual living in Tutukuri is it brings in uncertainty. To me, I see climate change as something directly correlated to uncertainty. We are not sure about what's going to happen today, tomorrow, day after. We're not sure about what we need to do in terms of making sure that the exposure and the vulnerability that we are having gets minimized. We are not sure as to what kind of adaptation that we need to bring about within ourselves, within the community, within the city. And this uncertainty is what is really scary. Because when you're very sure about something, you can do a lot of things with confidence. When you're sure about something, you can at least take, take on or take on the responsibility or take on the courage to do something innovative. So climate change being uncertain neither allows you to plan for future effectively, nor does it allow you to innovate. That is harsh reality and that is what we are experiencing now. Let me give you an example of what I am very familiar with, that is with the city of Chennai. Now, one of the things that I'm sure you've all heard, because the IPCC report was recently released and everybody's talking about how Tamil Nadu has been sort of, especially the East Coast has been showcased as some uh, a hot spot of some kind, saying it's one of the most vulnerable areas. In fact, Chennai is one of the top 20 Asian cities that have been designated as being very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Now, this is something that we already have started experiencing since 2005. In 2005, there was a major flood. In, in fact, if I can step back a bit, interestingly, Chennai has always had a decade of kind of a flood. Every decade, there used to be a flood. And, but what is more interesting is the records of this are very scantily available. In fact, the only place where these records are available with some kind of uh, systematic collection is the Archdale. The, the diocese of the Madras Mile, or Mile up, uh, uh, that, that particular wing. And so it is from there that we collected this particular data. Every decade since 1800, we've been having these floods of water logging. Water, I mean, the semantics of it is not important. But the fact of the matter is we've had floods. So in 2005, when the floods happened, and there was a lot of discussion about how this could possibly one of the beginnings of the impacts that we are experiencing. There was, there was large-scale rejection of the idea. They said, no, 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 it's poor stormwater drainage. It's uh, basically the fact that the city has not been planned. Everything was showcased in the domain of urban planning, poor urban planning, and crores of rupees were sunk into relaying some of the stormwater lanes and you know, coming up with flood mitigation measures like flood control channels, flood control mechanisms, and stuff like that. But if only people had taken a minute to look at how precipitation data, the rainfall data was changing in Chennai, the early morning could have actually been second. In fact, we looked at the 200-year-old rainfall data for the city of Chennai, and we found that Chennai is actually in the mid-rainfall regime. It receives an annual rainfall of about 1,248 mm, and that has been the pattern for the last 200 years. I'm talking about 2005, right? Until 2005, that was the pattern. You had this 1,248 millimeters average rainfall every year. Then we went a bit deeper to look at what exactly happens within this 200-year uh, period. Are there changes? Are there patterns that you can discern? We found that except for two or three years, there was no gross change in the amount of rainfall that was being poured down in the city. Then we looked at what was happening in recent times, which was very shocking. The results were very shocking because since 2002, Chennai came to be typified with what we would call extreme rainfall events. In fact, when I... When I made a presentation in 2006 on extreme rainfall events, people were laughing. They were saying this lady is coming up with new nomenclature to talk about something that doesn't exist at all. What, what is exactly is an extreme rainfall event? It's an unusual rainfall event that happens in an area where, the, as the name is self-explanatory, it's an extreme thing. In one or two days, it just pours like heaven as if the skies have opened up and all the water that's there just comes down onto the earth. So that's the kind of extreme rainfall event that we were experiencing in, since 2002. And that is what was actually contributing or triggering the floods of Chennai. So in 2005, it was a joke. Everybody was laughing at it. But in 2015, it happened again. But what is even more interesting was the research team that I collaborated with had predicted with near accuracy that 2015 would be a flooding year. But when the Chennai floods happened, the mega floods happened, 
all the attention came back to where it actually had to be that this is an issue on which some serious thinking is necessary maybe even at that point people were thinking of maybe it is climate change in fact maybe chennai city is vulnerable even then there was not a complete acceptance of the fact that it was something that we are already facing then of course there were a series of studies by a number of people who showed that salt water ingress was increasing there was a warming of certain pockets temperatures were also going haywire everything was happening more or less at the same time but the benchmark year for tamil nadu is 2002 if you actually track back and look at what is happening in tamil nadu since the last 20 25 years you would notice that 2002 is a kind of a watershed year and the chennai floods happened but in 2015 when we researched the chennai floods we were more or less sure that this decadal pattern of uh, water logging or you know flooding was to change and it was to change to a shorter duration so we had sort of predicted based on our analysis that 2021 or 22 would be a kind of an extreme rainfall year and there would be floods and it happened so it happened i'm happy that the model worked well but i'm not very happy that it really happened because a lot of people suffered and this time around newer areas were flooded and there was rampant kind of destruction there was a lot of unsaid agony that people had to go through so all this happened but what is also interesting is unlike in the past where you had more or less a kind of a steady kind of a rainfall pattern here we were moving to extremity one year we had extreme rainfall and it was followed by years of drought extreme drought you would all have remembered that famous photograph where leonardo da vinci caprio showed of chennai well a well in palavaram being you know watched by a lot of people it was essentially as they were saying it's sitting a zero water day chennai city was sitting a zero water day primarily because the drought was very intense we've had droughts in the past but it was not certainly this intense intense but since 2002 you have extremity you have extreme rainfall or extreme parchedness you have droughts so this kind of switching over leaves to people very 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 vulnerable so when people are vulnerable their ability to become resilient and the ability of the city to become resilient goes for a toss now what is resilience this is also something that's been in the news for a long time now people have been talking about it interestingly it was an ecologist who first spoke about resilience way back in the year 1972 but of course ecologists are very often the last people to be taken seriously because people generally believe that ecologists are people who are concerned only with plants and animals more, most probably with birds this is what they say they are the ones who watch birds and talk about birds which is far from truth but anyway coming back to what i was saying it impacts resilience you are no longer able to do things the way you want them to be done one so that leads to a situation where you cannot cope you cannot bounce back resilience in its simplest form is the ability to bounce back you cannot bounce back and even if you do the loss that you experience for that bouncing back is enormous there is loss of space there is loss of time there is loss of productivity a whole lot of things in fact this morning i read a paper from monga bay which said climate change also has impacted a lot of as an impact on lot of psychological parameters it talks about how the younger generation especially would be subject to anxiety and disorders mental disorders that was really scary which means you essentially essentially robbing the younger generation of an opportunity of uh, to realize their potential so you have young children who have to actually be highly motivated and pursue careers being subject to anxiety disorders we are actually murdering i would say not in the literal sense murdering a generation so that is the kind of impact it has so something as simple as you know uh, fla- i mean maybe the word simple is quite erroneous maybe as something as easily understood as flooding to as uh, something that's so difficult to understand such as mental issues climate change has impacts on various things on every facet of our life so this is a point that i think we should take home it's not just you know something obscure happening out there in the oceans or on the mountain tops where there is an increase in temperature or where there is sea level rise or where there is ingress where there is extreme rainfall every facet from the food we eat to the clothes we wear to the education that we pursue climate change has an impact having said all this why do you, one of the questions that i always ask my colleagues my students is why do you think you don't want to accept climate change is it because you don't subscribe to the idea that there's something as tremendous as that happening or is it because you feel you're helpless very often the response is it hasn't hit me yet this is the response that i get mostly from students they're saying we haven't experienced it you i mean 
which is very nice if people believe they have not experienced it, but that's not really certainly factual. Climate change has been impacting us in various ways in a silent way, which is something that we have not realized. We have not realized because we are, at least most of us are, having the privilege of shock absorbers. We are able to absorb those shocks, but it's not going to last forever. It's like that rubber band which cannot be stretched forever. But we should take a minute to remember that there are a whole lot of people, a whole lot of communities, marginalized sections of the society, who don't have the privilege of certainly people like us, where we are able to take in shocks, we are able to adapt. So climate change impact, in the IPCC report, in fact, talks about how the kind of progress that, or the kind of pace at which we are degrading the environment uh, has actually contributed to us not being able to adapt very well. We are not able to handle it very well. You know, earlier, at least, there was a semblance of hope. Now they're saying that's no longer there. So uh, we, when we think of communities, especially the marginalized communities who are really at the raw end of almost every stick that you can think of, their ability to adapt is very, very, very low. Not naturally low, and now with climate change impacts, it's going to be further low. Now, what would happen? Simple scenario. I'm, I'm taking the most simple example that I could think of. What would happen if people in agrarian areas, especially in drier tracts along the coast, are no longer able to practice agriculture? We've all known in Tamil Nadu, at least historically, two, three districts are known for migration. Ramnadapuram is one, Tarmapuri is another, from where agriculture was very, very poor. And so people were forced to migrate to both within the state, across the state, also outside India, to work as wage coolies. Now, if entire stretches of land that are no longer conducive for agriculture because of increase in temperature, because the planet, the earth becoming warmer by the day, you're no longer able to plant crops the way you would want to. So what would happen? These people would get displaced. They would displace themselves by, by with no choice and they would enter cities. So it led on to the load already that exists in the cities. I mean, migration is not simply a kind of resource consumption moving from one area to the other. It's a whole lot of things more. Your social security net goes for a talk. Your ability to plan for a city goes for a talk. In fact, yesterday I was in a meeting where we were discussing the kind of growth that Chennai city would experience. And somebody who's fairly senior said uh, Chennai experiences only 1% population growth every decade. That was a little too hard to digest, you know, too hard to accept. And then he said, as a subtext, that we don't account for the migrant population in that. So that is a big flaw, planning flaw. But the fact of the matter is, it, it may soon reach a point where this planning flaw hits us very badly in the head. So these are things, these are the most simple things that I'm thinking, talking about. But there are further complicated things which I'm sure other researchers will be able to talk about. So to link all that that I said, climate change is no longer a kind of a myth. It's real. It was always real. But for a very long time, we were under the guise of pretense of rejecting it because we didn't want to believe it. Secondly, climate change is also something that's impacting every facet of our life. And it's happening within Tamil Nadu at a pace that's really, really scary, except that there are no numbers to put there. I'm sure Dr. Nambi, in his valedictory address, may be able to put a number to it. Thirdly, every facet of our life gets hit. Our ability to adapt goes for a toss. Fourthly, we are very weak when it comes to providing shock absorbers that can protect marginalized communities. But the most important thing that I wish to talk about for the next two minutes is what can we do as human beings? So one of the things that always all lectures end up doing is to sort of give these advisories saying, you should do this, you should do that. Preach, uh, take a preachy mode saying, you know, you should shut off taps and you should not waste water. All that is fine. I mean, I'm not discounting that at all. All of it is fine. We need to be very responsible. If not, accept climate change as a reality, at least basic decency, we should all maintain a decent lifestyle. That's something I'm not going to reject or I'm not going to say you shouldn't be doing. But what is more important is every student, every participant, the young participants, I mean, first learn about the science of climate change. Because ultimately, climate change is one particular issue which has a scientific facet, which also has a social facet. And the scientific facet actually tells you the basic data. The social facet tells you how we can actually handle and do things in a much better manner. So it would be very good if you first read up about climate change in its holistic manner, take various perspectives into consideration, observe your place, look at what is happening, keep meticulous road, and then think about what can be done at the level of a neighborhood, at the level of a city, at the level of a district. 
don't predecide on what can be done earlier because this is all not something that's easily done it requires cumulative human action individual action is very important i'm not saying no to it at all but cumulative action is what is called for because i remember with some amount of agony that many years ago when we were in a meeting this was way back in 98 99 when climate change projections were being made about bangladesh a senior pro- professor from the university that said i am not even going to do anything about it because according to what you are saying half of bangladesh would be under the water by the time uh, i am about 50 55 so i am not really bothered about what would happen this kind of you know rejection this kind of you know disdain this kind of mockery is something i am certainly not casting any aspersions on it i'm saying but this is something that need not be there we are not certainly at a point where we can claim helplessness we are not certainly at a point where we can say nothing can be done so we'll have to accept it human action is needed to make sure that we are able to mitigate the impact of climate change but it has to be done together we have to collaborate we have to be together to do this individual actions are uh, too small in terms of scale to make a difference all these individual actions need to be accumulated it needs to be summed up to make sure that we take some positive action at a community level at a college level the word community need not be understood only as a neighborhood it can be understood as a college as a university as a district at various scales communities can be thought of we need to take this collective action to make sure something is done and we when doing so we have to make sure that the science part of it is not compromised upon generic templates are not going to work i am very very sure that my other panelists i mean my fellow speakers would endorse this tutukudi is an extremely fragile kind of dish largely because of its presence next to a shallow system see marine system the gulf so whatever needs to be done there has to be done with a lot of care for instance you cannot certainly copy paste what's happening in chennai on to tutukudi ideally the college should take a leadership role given the fact that you already have a leadership in the space of botany in the space of biological sciences you should have a kind of a leadership role you should take on the leadership role in drafting the climate action plan for the district of tutukudi that would be a very good output that you would be giving to the state because the state is now at a point where they're trying to figure out how to actually handle it they repeatedly mentions have been made about the chennai flood the tamunad uh, about tamunad being vulnerable and tamunad being in the limelight and stuff like that so one thing that could come as a concrete output maybe this conference and the learning from this conference itself could result in a climate action plan for the district of tutukudi that's led by st mary's college and on that note i will stop thank you ma'am thank you so much uh, really ma'am uh, i'm dr glory head of uh, department of botany ma'am um uh, really ma'am we are very fortunate uh for giving a wide opening uh for this need based conference uh, of course from your uh, conversation we came to know uh, that you are, you are, you are filled with the total knowledge on current rate of climate change uh um your presentation citing with your personal and correlating with the meteorological data really so thought provoking for climate change action is the immediate and urgent requirement uh, it's very heart rending and it's very shocking to hear the impact of climate change the way it affects human health and the social sector and how it affects the farmland and food security uh, your point that individual action must be in the need of the art uh that uh, as we know the uh, this climate change um, is a common problem collective responsibility is required the individual attention must be uh there uh, to abate the current rate of climate change issue thank you so much for giving a bright opening ma'am thank you so much uh excellent uh, my heartfelt thanks uh dr sir principal lucia rose for uh giving a nice word of felicitation uh, thank you so much i also thank all the participants who patiently uh, waited for our resource person thank you so so much you can join uh, for the next session thank you so much
thank you all uh, dear participants we shall break for one hour and kindly join the meeting again sharply at 12 noon Don't do हेलो हेलो यस मैम वी कैन हियर यू मैम हेलो सर हेलो सर आई एम आई एम डॉक्टर एम ग्लोरी हेड एंड एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर आई वांट टू वेलकम सर बल दिस दिन इज श्रीवास्तव हैज एक्चुअली जॉइंड आई एम हियर हेलो सर आई एम हियर 
Shall we start the program, sir? No, I think you are not asked. You don't. I'm here. Hello, I'm okay. Can, am I audible? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, Dinesh. How are you? Uh, nice to see you and thank you for uh, Ma'am, shall we start? Uh, listening to my advice, yeah? Am I audible, Selvanandi? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you, ma'am. Um, okay. okay. My warm welcome to Sir. Um, we'll try. I will talk to Sir later after finishing the forum. Now we can start with the program. Okay. I think I'm not audible to others. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you, ma'am. We can start. Okay. We start. Good afternoon to everyone. Once again, I welcome you all for the first technical session of the international webinar on climate change and future challenges organized by Marian Star Center, PG and Research Department of Botany, St. Mary's College Autonomous, Tutkuri, sponsored by Department of Biotechnology, New Delhi. On behalf of the Department of Botany, I wholeheartedly welcome our resource person, Professor Dr. Ashwintini Urango, Executive Dean of Science, Nelson Mandela University, South Africa, to this international webinar. I request Dr. Flora, Assistant Professor of Botany, to introduce the resource person. Respected resource person, Aswindini Muranga, Sister Principal, Sister Secretary, Head of the Department of Botany, Program Coordinator, members of the staff and my dear participants. Wish you all a very good afternoon. I had the privilege of warmly welcoming everyone to this international webinar on climate change and future challenges organized by the Marian Star Center Department of Botany, St. Mary's College Tutukudi, sponsored by DBT Star College Team, New Delhi. I suppose all of you would have heard of the saying that Fortune favors the prepared mind. However, we are living in the age of global warming and climate change, and the future of our planet is very uncertain as of today. Hence, we may have to rephrase the saying as survival favors the prepared mind. I'm sure that this lecture on the host realities of climate change by Aswindini Morocco uh, will help us to understand the realities of climate change. First, I would like to welcome our resource person, Professor Dr. Aswindini Muraga, Executive Dean of Science, Nelson Mandela University, South Africa. At this point, I'm very pleased to introduce him to this forum. Aswindini Muraga grew up in the village of Wempe district, Limpopo province, South Africa. He's the eldest child born to parents who never having had the opportunity to attend formal schooling themselves, nonetheless emphasized the importance of education to their children. As we need this uh, introduction to formal education was rather modest. Cl classes in the primary school in his rural villages of Lava Mondo uh, took place under trees. However, from this humble beginning in life, a uh, long love of learning was born. Once he had completed grade 10, uh, he was taken under the wing of his uncle, who was then a high school teacher and now a professor. Together with the financial support from his beloved late grandmother in the form of uh, uh, her meager old uh, high school, which is rated the top mathematics and science school in South Africa, despite it being in rural areas. After high school, he wanted to study medicine. However, financial constraints led uh, him to enroll for a BSc degree at the University of Vienna in Stur. 
on completion of his bsc family pressure for financial assistance led him to enroll for the university uh, education diploma uh, at the university of venda where he received professional teacher training for one year on completion of his university education diploma instead of going into school teaching he decided to follow his passion for science uh, passion for science when he applied to study honors in mathematics at the university of witwatersrand and honors in physics at the university of cape town the later option won mostly owing to university of cape town's willingness to uh, partially uh, found uh, his studies since Aswindini's uh, undergraduate studies has been completed at the historically uh, black university. He was only allowed to do his honors degree over the period of two years instead of the usual one year. His honors degree in theoretic, theoretical physics was awarded in the uh, in first class. He then enrolled for an MSc in Uh, theoretical physics in university of cape town uh, which he completed effectively in one year and which was awarded with distinction professor jean clements supervised his msc thesis with the success of his msc he was invited to apply for a phd program at the university of minnesota uh, by professor lori mcleran and at duke university by professor bernd muller both in the usa he chose uh, to go to minnesota to study under the supervision of professor larry macler however just as he was to start his phd project professor macler left the university of minnesota to lead the theoretical physics group of brookhaven national laboratory professor joseph kabusta then supervised aswin indini's phd he graduated with phd in theoretical physics in 2002 and was awarded the uh, anisar rahman award by the school of physics and astronomy the university of minnesota in 2003 the award is given every year to the graduates who have made a significant scientific contribution while uh, still phd students on completion of his phd aswin dinis was uh, in, um, invited to take up a post doctoral research position with the institute of theoretical physics at gw uh, gothi university in frankfurt germany uh, his host was professor drick uh, uh, rishki at the end of his post doc position in the frankfurt uh, he got a second post doctoral position with the theory group of gsi laboratory in Darmstadt, Germany. This was, however, cut uh, short when he was invited to return to South Africa to take up a position as a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town in February 2005, which he holds until 2000, uh, September 2010. In October 2010, he took up the position of an associate professor in the physics department at the University of Johannesburg, and concurrently. Uh, Uh, a position of doctorship of UJ Sovato Science Center. He established the well-known UJ Sovato Science Center. In April 2016, he took up a position of executive dean of the Faculty of Science at the Nelson Mandela University uh, in Kyoberha, uh, in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. A position he currently holds. As when the studying the nature and properties of uh, matter under extreme conditions uh, in heavy uh, ion collisions and astrophysics as well as the properties of new state of matter produced during heavy ion collision experiment at large particle accelerators such as the let uh, relativistic heavy ion collider uh, facility in brookham national laboratory New York and the Large Hadron Collider at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, known as CERN, in Switzerland. This state of matter is believed to have existed, uh, existed just for a microsecond at the beginning of the universe uh, after the Big Bang, and might also exist the deep interior of compact stars such as neutron stars. As we know, 
has made outstanding contribution of theoretical physics. Uh, his uh, thesis work on casual second order viscous uh, relativistic uh, fluid dynamics was uh, seminal. It has been cited more than 1800 times uh, and is now incorporated in large sta uh, state of the art computer course written around the world uh, to model collisions between nuclei at high energy. His work has been integrated in experiments done in various locations from Long Island to Geneva at uh, uh, facilitates um, at the billion dollar to $10 billion levels. Aswinindini is considered one of the leading scientists in the uh, uh, relativistic treatment of viscosity. Apart from his own research interest, Aswinindini is also an outstanding and recognized science educator and with a strong passion for an interest in taking science to society, particularly to rural and disadvantaged communities. He received the 2013 Distinguished Leadership Award for International and the 2013-14 NSTF BHP Billion Award for his outstanding contributions to science education and leadership. In 2015, he has elected president in, of the South African Institute of Physics, a position he held for a long term of two years until 2017 when he was elected immediate post president of SAIP with the responsibility of international liaisons portfolio on the SAIP council. Currently, he is an ambassador for the teacher development and outreach and public understanding of physics project of the SAIP. From 2018 to 2022, he has been appointed to serve on the South African National Space Agency Board and recently has been appointed to serve on the South African Council for National Scientific Professions. He served on the board and medical field in the expert working group which worked on the configuration of National Institute for Theoretical Physics into the National Institute for Theoretical and Computational Sciences. He serves as the International Advisory Committee of the American Strategy of, uh, on Fundamental Physics and Applications. From 2018 to 2021, he represented South Africa and Africa on the Sea Level Commission on Particles and Field at the International Union of Pune and Applied Physics. From 2022 to 2024, he was elected Vice Chair of Sea Level Commission at the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. He is the part of the International Advisory Group at the U.S. Particle Physics Community Planning Exercise organized by the Division of Particles and Fields of the American Physical Society from 2020 to 22. He has been the chair of the judging panel for the mathematics and physics category at the Global Undergraduate Awards. Aswindini is still active in academic life as an executive dean of the faculty science. He is an academic leadership group, administration and management. He still teaches students uh, for higher and basic education. He still conducts research. He still supervise students and postdocs, and he is involved in public engagement with science. He still reviews project program proposals, student dissertations, thesis, and ass assessments. He serves as a national and international conference organizing advisory committees. At the time of writing this short bi uh, biography, Aswinindini is the chair of the local and regional committee involved in organizing the uh, African School of Fundamental Physics and its applications. Uh, ASP 2022 and uh, the African Conference Physics and Application ACP to, uh, 2022 to be hosted by Nelson Mandela University of Kuberga uh, during uh, December 2022. These activities will form part of the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development and the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics uh, centenary uh, celebrations under the theme 100 years of physics in Africa, the past and present and the future. We are really fortunate to have such a renowned resource person with us today. On behalf of the Marian Star Center, I extend a hearty welcome to you, sir.
I also use this opportunity to welcome our principal, Reverend Dr. Sister A.S.T. Lucia Rose, our secretary, Reverend Sister Flora Berry, head of the Department of Botany, Dr. M. Glory, overall coordinator, member secretary, Stock College Scheme, Reverend Dr. Sister Aroki Genesius Alphonse, the deans and head of the departments. I also welcome the staffs who have come for this program. Last but not least, I welcome the participants who are connected here from all over India. Welcome you all once again. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the great introduction and warm words of welcome. Dear participants, please turn on your camera for the photo session. Thank you all. The mind that opens up to a new idea never returns to its original size, says Albert Einstein. Now, let us open our mind to hear from our eminent resource person, Dr. Aswinzini Urango. Sir, sir, the session is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, get a few seconds uploading my screen. I hope I'm, I'm audible. It's, it's really a great pleasure. And thank Esther, you are audible, sir. Thank you. And thank you for thank that um, introduction. Really, uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I'm going to share my, my screen now. Uh, give me a moment. Okay, thank you very much once again, and I hope my screen is visible to the participants. Yes, sir, it's visible, sir. Okay, thank, thank you very much once again. Um, it is a pleasure to be giving this uh, international webinar today uh, uh, across the Indian Ocean from, 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 from South Africa. Um, I have I have titled uh, the presentation "Facing the Harsh Realities of Climate Change." Um, just a, a bit of orientation. Uh, this is in one of the campuses uh, of Nelson Mandela University, uh, which is in, in 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 a city that has got a new name, which is Taveja, and uh, it used to be known as Port Elizabeth. And this is the eastern side, southeastern side of South Africa, facing India. Therefore, we are on the Indian uh, Ocean coast. And, and as it has been already been alluded, I am currently the executive dean of the Faculty of Science, uh, where we have about uh, 13 departments, um, uh, including Botan. I am a physicist, but I'm not uh, in the physics department. Uh, 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 I came from outside uh, to, to take the leadership position of an executive dean. So I, I oversee a, a 13 academic departments. So it's good to be hosted by Botany Department because uh, most of my colleagues as well who, who debate on, on environmental issues are coming from Botany Department here. Just also for an orientation, I always like to, to give this, this map. This is a pre-1994 pre map of South Africa. Uh, as you are all aware, South Africa became a democracy uh, in 1994. And the current, the current map has, 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 has changed. And this is a united map of South Africa. And uh, you can see Port Elizabeth is down here in the, in the, in the, in the southeast. Um, uh, in the Indian Ocean coast. However, where I grew up, it's all the way up, bordering Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and, uh, and Botswana. That's, that's my, my, my hometown. And this is the village where I grew up. 
um, uh, and is the is the is, is, is the village that shaped who I am. Uh, I grew up very much in love with, with nature. Uh, the the forestry, the vegetation, agriculture was pretty much part of who 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 I was before I moved to the cities. And it's a place that I still visit to very often because uh, I've got family members in this part of, of South Africa. Um, the outline of my talk will be really be um, just to, to talk about the scale and the implications or the impact of, 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 of climate uh, 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 change or climate crisis that we face. And, and what are the possible responses? And uh, you will have uh, uh, the opportunity to hear more uh, uh, deep understanding uh, 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 from other experts that will be sharing some ideas with you. I would like to focus my attention basically on, on the science communication of climate change, because I think that's, that's, that's the problem uh, 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 that we have. It's, it's another crisis that is compounding the crisis of climate change. So we all are aware of the UN the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Every university is, is speaking about them. Every country probably is trying to align to, to these uh, uh, SDGs. Uh, and we will make connections. Uh, 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 with these SDGs as, as, as we briefly discuss the impact of climate change. And in, in the continent where I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you from, uh, in the African continent, we also have the, the African Union Agenda 2063, which talks about the Africa we want. And you will see that um, the, 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 the matter that relates to or environment are at the heart also in, in, in Africa, just as they are in India. We also have a local national development plan that also take the aspects of environment into account. So if one look at science scientists um, and, and social scientists, um, uh, there are questions that, that we ask. Uh, as scientists, we are asked all the time, what is it that we're doing about, about societal problem? And climate change is also a societal problem by itself. Yeah? So the environmental changes that are induced by human activities, the, the, um, the, this change is occurring at an unprecedented scale and pace, and the window of opportunity to avoid a catastrophe outcomes in societies around the world is typically closing. I will show this through the report throughout my, uh, my presentation uh, using the data and the figures uh, uh, that were released uh, in a report recently at the end of February this year to show that really we don't have much time. Um, the, 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 these outcomes, which I call them uh, facing the harsh realities of, of, of um, uh, the climate change, they include economic instability. We have started to see some of these uh, uh, harsh realities. Uh, Large-scale involuntary migration, conflicts, famine, and other potential uh, uh, effects such as the, the collapse of social and economic systems. This is slowly happening in front of our eyes. And the collapse of social and economic systems, this is the one which will probably be the nail in the coffin. This is the last nail in the coffin. And it's happening in a slow motion, like a movie being rewinded. And if we don't act now, we know what will happen. I will spend much, uh, some, some, some minutes on this one. So the, I'm going to focus my presentation on three things that I think are necessary to be shifted uh, across the political and, 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 and policy communities. And that is the scale and pace of environmental breakdown. This has to be communicated in our scientific communication. We, we really do not speak about the scale and the pace of environmental breakdown. 
we always talk about climate change and global and the temperature. But if we want to get the buy-in from our communities, from our society, we need to communicate the state and the pace of environmental breakdown. We also, of course, have to talk about the implications for societies. At the moment, we hear about global warming. It looks like it's something that is out there and it's not here. And it's our failure to communicate the, 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 the science behind uh, what is happening. And of course, I will focus much also on the, on the need for transformative change, uh, the change by us, the change by the society. And such a change is not just any change. It has to be transformative. And I will explain what we mean by transformative change. So out of this report that I, 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 I've mentioned, and this report, which is titled uh, uh, Climate Change 2022 from IPCC, which talks about uh, the, the impacts and the adoption, uh, the ad uh, adoption and, 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 and the future. It, 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 it's really highlighting all those three aspects that I've just uh, 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 spoken about, especially the, from the impact to, to, to potential solutions. As I've said, these negative impacts on the environment, they drive a complex and dynamic process of environmental destabilization. And I will, I will highlight towards the end when I speak about science communication of climate change, that we need to actually talk about the right language. Just saying climate change, it looks like people and the society are getting used to climate change. And unless we change the language, as I will, I will argue later, uh, then it will be business as usual. So talking about environmental destabilization, it's, it's better than environmental change. Yes. And as you can see that these negative impacts uh, are mounting much faster and, 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 and they are changing at faster rates than have been previously uh, depicted and predicted. And this was published in the article by Nature uh, uh, to say that actually what we, we were thinking about the pace of climate change is actually happening faster than we thought. And this is indicated in this figure that is coming from uh, the, the IPCC report that is really looking at the temperature uh, changes uh, 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 relative to the, the year 1850 to 1800, normalizing by that year. And looking at the current uh, pace, we can see that there are different trajectories of which how this temperature uh, 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 change uh, 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 will proceed. And those different pathways, they pretty much depend on our actions as, 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 as humanity on this planet. In terms of the implications, which I refer to them as harsh realities that we are facing, we, we know that our planet ecosystem, it's a natural system that is complex. Um, and once it's destabilized, the consequences of these destabilizations are the likes of the extreme weather to soil infertility, they will impact the human systems from, from local to global levels. We already seen those, and I will, I, will, I, will, I will show some examples that are coming from scientific studies and reports. And we know that this is already underway as the report that was published on uh, 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 about um, three, four days ago uh, from, from the Nature article. So these impacts, they range from uh, deforest, uh, deforestation to natural disasters that we are witnessing in front of our eyes. Um, it's just that they are happening in local communities and they are not happening at once globally. And we think that these are things that are happening in, in pockets. But if you look globally, these things are happening at a faster rate. As I've said, the most and probably the dangerous 
harsher reality we are still going to face is the collapse of key social and economic systems at local and potential, even global level. This one is real and it's coming to us at a faster rate and we haven't even woken up and realized that it is happening and it's coming to us at a faster rate. Due to this high level of complexity, the scale of, of this environmental break, breakdown and systemic, systemic nature of the problem, responding to this breakdown may be the greatest challenge that humans have faced in history. Uh, at the moment, there are many, many other factors globally that are distracting us from focusing on what is really the biggest threat at returning the humanity. These challenges, these harsh realities that I speak about, they are of transdisciplinary nature. And I will explain. They can no longer be addressed by natural scientists alone. Uh, we need natural scientists, we need social scientists, and we need those in humanities to come together. And we need our societies, we need our politicians, we need our government. That's what I mean by transdisciplinary solutions are needed. The solutions are not going to come solely from scientists. Scientists can explain what is happening, but that's it. What then? We need the whole society and civilization of humanity to come together. We also are starting to see simultaneous extreme events. And these simultaneous events that are coming at the same time, they compound the problem. Increasing heat and drought, heat stress among the workers, reduced crop yield, reduced productivity. We have started to see this. Uh, increased food prices we, we, in my country. Uh, we are now battling with the, the increase in, in, fuel, in fuel prices. And, and that has got a negative impact on, 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 on food prices, uh, reduced household incomes. All these things are happening and we are thinking they are just political. So it's much bigger than, 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 than this. And if one look at the report, the report also gives us just a flavor of what are the impacts that are being observed currently today we are observing a, a, a trends that have emanated from our activities on this planet. And this, 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 these trends and these observations can be grouped into two categories. It's, it's, it's the observed impacts of climate change on ecosystems, our biodiversity. And these are also classified by regions, Asia, Africa, uh, and all other regions. And, and one can see that it looks like we don't have much time to address this. As I've said, the solution to our problems, which are climate change oriented, will come not only from one discipline, they need a multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary. Model. Physicists have to be on board. Botanists have to be on board. Uh, and lawyers, you know, educators, yeah, every one of us, we have to come to this and say, we have got a common threat and how do we solve it? And the second category, of course, it's on the human systems. And I will elaborate what uh, 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 these systems are. Yeah. And when I say transdisciplinary, it means we have to transcend the academic space. We have to go beyond our towers in our offices, in our academic spaces, in our universities, in our colleges. Transdisciplinary means you need to transcend beyond the university space. We can debate about this as academics. If we end up just debating this amongst ourselves, then that is not going to help. Uh, it, is, it is estimated that the poorest half of the global populations are responsible for only 10% of, of the greenhouse gas emissions with half emissions attributed to the richest 10% of the, 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 the people. If we're going to only address the richest, we will be leaving the majority poor, who are probably going to be affected most. 
And so therefore transdisciplinarity means that we need to reach out to all these communities. And that's why we need a transformational response to the problems that we face. And, 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 and here you can see the pictures of the impacts of the climate change. And these are the harsh realities. On the top, on the top left, you see the picture coming out of Mozambique. Mozambique is in the, on the low le on, at the, on the low level uh, and, and on the on the on the on the coastal of, 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 of Indian Ocean. The, the top left picture there, it is showing you really the harsh reality happening during our time, during our lifetime. And you see people seeking shelter on top of their roof because of the flooding that is happening uh, uh, at that time in, in Mozambique. And this year, the bottom left, this year, on the outskirts of the city of Johannesburg in South Africa, people have gone and built on where the river used to be. And the rivers have made a comeback. And all those outskirts in Johannesburg where people have built are now facing the harsh realities of this economic climate change. And uh, this is what I refer to as to say, the poorest will be hit hard because these are not in the city. They are in the outskirts of the city of Johannesburg, coming to Johannesburg to seek for jobs. And because we didn't plan for them, they end up building everywhere and even in the in the in the in the in the in the uh, in the lowland where when floods comes they are building on the way and on the pathway of these rivers that are in this this is this is happening in January February this year in Johannesburg and and and, and these are the things that we face almost on every day there are there are overlapping challenges here uh, uh, as, as pointed out by this report, the IPCC report, the limited access to water, and, 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 and this is a risk to, 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 to health system of income. Yeah. Climate sensitive livelihoods, uh, uh, this speaks to farming when there is drought, of course, we, we can no longer farm. Yeah. High levels of poverty. We were already in, 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 in a poverty country, especially in South Africa. I know India uh, largely, that's also the, the case. Uh, and imagine the climate crisis that is compounding what we already uh, are facing now. And we, if we have got the weak leadership, uh, be it leadership in science, political leadership, community leadership, therefore we are really facing the real harsh, harsh realities of, of this climate change. And, and in some cases, funding is necessary in order to, to replan and readapt, as I will show the, the, in the following slide. Environmental breakdown, it is a result of structures and, 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 and dynamics of social and economic systems. And this drive unsustainable human impacts on the environment. Climate change combines the unsustainable use of natural resources, a growing urbanization as, as well. It's compounding uh, our problems that we are facing today. And, and we have to, to really collectively think about, about the impact on nature, collectively and uh, holistically. Uh, 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 most people, when you talk about climate, they immediately think about weather. Oh, today it's hot out there. And the blame is it's, it's on the scientists for not communicating the science correctly. Yeah. The, the moment the, the, the weather today changes, people will immediately say that that's climate change. And, 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 and that is hampering us on, on winning the war uh, 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 on this climate crisis. So there are, we, we need to look at nature in its holistic sense when we are addressing the impact of climate change on, on nature from, you know, how nature used to work in pollination to the coastal uh, uh, 
protection, tourism, uh, food security, water, water filtration, health, clean air, all, all those things, one has to communicate them as a package and not only one at a time because people will not see the connection of, of, of all this. It's, I'm glad that the, the report has highlighted the need to shift to transformational changes. They need to really look at climate change as an, as, a, as an ecosystem, rather than just looking at weather patterns only, but start to look at, um, at, 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 at climate risks uh, 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 and, and how we can mitigate them, but at the same time also looking at the impacts uh, of, 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 of the climate change and coming up also with uh, with 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 solutions to to this risk, so we cannot look at the impacts only. We also have to look at the risks. We also have to look at yes, there are impacts. Yes, we can adapt, and how do we adapt? We we need that as a package, and not going to speak about only selected uh, uh, aspects of this uh, 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 climate change. That's what I, 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 I refer to a transformational response to, 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 to climate change. We need new ways of thinking about climate change and not one dimensional way. And, and we will need to do that because uh, 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 as the title of the international webinar is talking also about the future. Uh, our future will, will have to encompass um, reduced climate uh, 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 risks, we will have to, to, to move towards adaptation, yeah, because we are late. That's why we need to really talk about adaptation while we're trying to reverse uh, 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 the damage. We need to also start to, to speak about adaptation. At the same time, we cannot only speak about adaptation. We have to speak about adaptation while at the same time speak about uh, mitigation, re reducing greenhouse. Yeah? We also need to, to really uh, start to enhance biodiversity. Uh, we've got experts in, in, the, in the Department of Botany in this college. We also need to talk about how do we combine this uh, with achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, 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 because when you look at the SDGs, there seems to be a prioritization, and most of them you will not be able to achieve them if you are not addressing the problem of climate change. Yeah. And we have to also communicate the wider benefits of, of, of addressing climate change, uh, a crisis, you know, uh, 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 the wider benefits of adaptation, yeah. uh, eradicating poverty, good health reduced inequality, the life and, and on land and, 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 and below water will be enhanced. If we, are, if, we, if, we, if we discussed SDGs separately because we want rankings in our universities, we are missing the point. And sometimes I blame the rankings on the universities because they, they, they prioritize some certain aspects. And because of that, the universities tend to go to to focus on where the, 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 the incentives are. If the rankings are just saying, looking at the SDGs, but we're not looking at the bigger threats and, and holistically uh, 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 and using a holistic approach of a new transdisciplinary approach, the universities will go there. The universities will tend to do what, uh, 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 what incentives are coming their way. Yeah. So, uh, 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 this, this latest report, uh, uh, if one reads it, you will see that um, uh, 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 there are solutions that are being suggested. And the question for me is how do I communicate these solutions uh, to the policymakers, but also to the citizens? I think that will be our, 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 our next greatest challenge. Yes, here are the, the provided solutions uh, or the recommended solutions by IPCC, what do we do? Yeah, we can talk about them today. The question is, in, it, it is upon each one of us as to what do we do with them? Yeah, as scientists, 
there, 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 is, there, is, there is a limit as to how far we can go. We can play our role as scientists and say, this is what has happened. But collectively, uh, as humanity, we need to uh, take this, this, this forward. And, and we have to act now as, 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 as it has been since, since the, 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 the beginning of the century. The call has been, we have to act now. Uh, and we have to keep on, 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 on now changing the language to say that the, 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 the call to act really, it, it's we are acting to redress and everyone has to be there in acting to redress uh, the damage on, 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 on the climate. Okay. There, there, there is currently all signs of inaction. Uh, uh, that I can say, and, 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 and this is what we are observing. Otherwise, we will not have all these problems uh, that are coming year after year, flooding, drought, uh, 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 all around us. If, if these this solutions in terms of mitigation and what needs to be done, we are being acted uh, upon. And depending on, 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 on which, which, which action we take, um, uh, uh, we, 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 we therefore chart the destiny of our planet. Yeah. And, and the destiny of our planet is really in, in our, our hands. Uh, already in, in 20, 20, 2019, uh, as if we were predicting that there will be this uh, international webinar, at Nelson Mandela, uh, 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 I, I, I led, I led um, a symposium. Um, uh, which was um, uh, 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 held during the National Science Week, uh, uh, which was really about literally taking science to the people about climate change, from one informal settlement of Tala to another one in Chambaletu in the Eastern Cape uh, 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 province, talking about the same harsh realities uh, that, are, that are affecting our lives and that will affect the next generations and the, the future of, of, of our planet where we did the same thing, invite um, uh, speakers to come from different walks of life to come and talk about the harsh realities of life, of, 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 of climate change. And I'm glad that the IPCC later on, which means now in this year, in 2022, uh, they have re-emphasized these harsh realities again, but uh, this time with possible solutions. Uh, on the on the on the right hand side, you see the article that that I published uh, last year, 17th of October, uh, 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 in relation to the Nobel Prize for Physics, uh, and I was arguing that this is a game changer, and this is also highlighting uh, the fact that even if I am a physicist. Uh, I need to, 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 to contribute. Uh, I cannot leave this only to say, well, environmental scientists will, will figure it out. Uh, climate change is not only for environmental scientists. We should be all be in this. And uh, I invite you to, to read uh, 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 this article where I'm arguing that this Nobel Prize for Physics is a game changer. Firstly, it speaks about that the climate change is not only for uh, 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 the environmental scientists on uh, uh, it is really a a global effort and within the the, the scientific fraternity all disciplines have to come together and and, and really assist uh, 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 humanity in addressing this this challenge that that, that we are the other message was science has spoken. The vindication of the Nobel Prize is it means that science has spoken on, on, on the climate change. And it's left to us, by us, I mean uh, the citizens of this planet, to take this message seriously and 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 and, and start to, 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 to act. In doing so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that. The, 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 the language as well has to change. 
uh, 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 because if we don't change the language and use the, the probably outdated language, uh, such as climate and, 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 and the climate change, uh, 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 as, as we, we are used to it, we need to shift to really demonstrate the urgency of, of this challenge that we have. We need to start talking about climate and nature emergency. We need to, stop, uh, to start talking about climate crisis, climate or environmental breakdown, because that's what is happening. It's no longer about things are changing and if we don't do something, the situation is going to get worse. The, 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 the nature article and the, the IPCC's latest report that was released recently, it's saying the window is narrowing uh, down quite rapidly. So can we still talk about change or we have to talk about emergency because we are not, it's, it's not fear mongering. The, the scientific results is out there saying it is an emergency, it is a crisis, it is a breakdown, uh, it is a, a, a really a, a global hit. So if this evidence is there, let us change the language uh, in, in our scientific uh, communication uh, as well. We need to start thinking also as scientists, you know, um, and, and those like me who are very much in the advocacy side. Uh, we need to perhaps uh, leave, leave the language that masks and underplay the agency to address climate change. Business as usual, the current trends, uh, I've used climate change, you know, that probably have been happening and we have been preaching that and people are thinking it's business as usual. We need to really uh, uh, come up with uh, uh, the appropriate language. So updating the language used must reflect the need to support a just and safe transformation in responding to the climate change. Yeah. So climate change or climate crisis is a transdisciplinary issue and it needs transdisciplinary uh, uh, approach. I always use this, 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 this picture of Stephen Hawking uh, representing the scientist and Nelson Mandela uh, representing, you know, the social justice part. You cannot address the problem just by looking at science and you cannot only address it politically. I have highlighted that. So natural science, social science, and the humanities should converge in responding to this climate crisis. Um, however, this is very important. The scientific method and how we came to what we know today should not be lost in the mix. And it's very important. And, and we have to make sure that we maintain that, especially as scientists. We need to make sure that otherwise, we will not be able to solve future problems if we get swallowed in the mix in terms of the scientific method, how science is done, and how do we report on those three data. As we do that, let us not forget about the poor of the poorest. Yeah? The poorest of the poor have got solutions also. The indigenous knowledges that they have if you just assist them and, and, and we listen to them uh, and we guide each other, we, you will see that we might mitigate some of these challenges. And this is the last section that I'm going to bring, which is I do. Uh, 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 what I do, uh, uh, it's on public engagement uh, 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 as a scientist, even now as a, the Dean of the Faculty of Science. I take my science uh, uh, faculty to the poor communities uh, with, the, with the different messages, but mostly to take signs, not only about um, climate change and climate crisis, but to science topics in general, uh, because now I'm responsible for many science disciplines as an executive dean of the faculty. But the only way we will win the war is to partner with communities. That, that's 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 a, and, 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 and we have to build sustainable model uh, and long lasting partnerships of scientists and communities. That's very important to, 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 to. 
And this is a picture of us uh, 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 going to villages and spending uh, nights under trees, uh, 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 devising solutions to teach where there are no electricity and to teach our, about our home, uh, uh, our planet in the whole solar system and what it means for us. And you can see that we, we underestimate that uh, young, the youth will take the message forward. And, 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 and I'm glad I, I have played my role in, 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 in getting the, the scientific message across to the young and the elder in the, in the most rural areas uh, across South Africa. Um, and, and of course, in the school education, we should not treat school system and our, our curricula separate from the challenges. If at all, perhaps we should prioritize uh, the climate crisis uh, 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 in a new way, which is transdisciplinary to the schools, to the curriculum, both at, at school and at the university. It should not be only in the environmental sciences curriculum, botanical curriculum. It should translate into mathematics, statistics, you know, uh, physics, it's, 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 it's there, but computer science, this has to be part of our curriculum because curriculum is, is the generation of the new of future, of, 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 of the new generations of core cohorts new generations of the citizens that we are creating. But if they don't see that, therefore they will not think it is important. And, and it's very important that we do that. Yeah. Right from primary schools, we need to, to engage the, the youth because they are the ones that are going to really take uh, the messages uh, 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 forward about addressing climate uh, crisis. Whether we do it under the trees, which is great because then you are also reminding uh, the poor communities that they don't need fancy infrastructure that will come and destroy the same nature that they have. You go back and say, let's sit and let, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's stand under the trees and talk about uh, nature and how to protect it. Um, uh, you cannot wait for the government to come and destroy the nature by building infrastructure for you to have the walls to sit in and then preach about uh, the issues of, of, of climate change. Uh, where you can, you need to send the, 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 the message. And if you can have access to this young mind, uh, 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 I'm saying talking to politicians is okay, but this is the group that we need to be speaking to. to, speak to. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the educators, educators play a very key role. I came through educators. Most of you have come through uh, educate, the hands of educators. And therefore, the message about climate change, if it can go to the educators, there will be a, a speed and a, 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 a recovery in terms of our, our plans. Yeah. Because if we teach the, 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 the young ones on uh, you teach them and you will have to keep on repeating. But if you send the message to the educators, you are going to educate the nation. And they are the ones that will become ambassadors of, 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 of the address of this climate crisis. Yeah. So as, as I I've, 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 I've used this before, uh, last month in another webinar in another college in India, talking about the value of science, mm -hmm. arguing that science is of great value to society. We should not underestimate that. Nations that invest in science develop and progress at a much healthy rate and in a sustainable way, of course. And uh, most societies, they stand on the pillars of scientific knowledge and technology. All our social activities are much dependent on science and technology. And the sustainable use and development of these is going to assist us to redress the damage that has been caused already. Yeah. Science teaches us to live healthy lives and to protect our environment. Imagine if this is being taught to the, the, the young ones, the, to the basic in the basic education, primary school, all the way to, to the university, in, in fact. 
then the message is clear from my side. Uh, and as I argue in this uh, newspaper article about the, the Nobel Prize in, in physics, the science part is clear. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and re rapidly closing window to secure a livelihood future. This is a conclusion from the IPCC report. And if you look at this conclusion, and look at my article in 2021 on the local national newspaper on Maryland Radio. It was started as the same, that now the science is clear and it's up to us. Uh, and the report uh, from the IPCC has suggested some solutions. And as Nelson Mandela was saying, during the AIDS pandemic, that was uh, rampaging uh, uh, our, our, our nations in South Africa. We said the fight against this global scourge of HIV and AIDS is in your hands. And this message is, is, is not different from the message about the, 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 the redress and addressing the, 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 harsh, the, the, the harsh realities that we are, uh, are facing uh, and, and, and coming up with solutions for, 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 for this climate crisis. It is again in, in, in our hands. It is in your hands as, as well. So, and, 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 and not, remember, not forgetting that of all its many values, the greatest value of science must be the freedom to doubt. And this must be part of public engagement with, 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 with science, rather than the scientists going to pour the information. We need to engage. It has to be a two-way street engaging our society, also and the politicians as well. If we do that, we will be able to change the world for good. I thank you very much for listening, and 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 and, and I hope I have managed to convey some of the harsh realities and what could be done in a in a, in a much broader sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your lively presentation. Uh, dear participants, it is the time to discuss your doubts with the resource person. Now you can ask your doubts directly or unmuting your mic, or you can share your queries in the chat box as well. Uh, hello, sir. Hello. Uh, I, I, hello, hello. I'm Glory from St. Mary's College. I have doubt uh, with a resource person. Um, uh, we scientific fraternity uh, are aware of. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you, ma'am. Uh, we scientific fraternity are somehow aware of uh, those some are skeptic of uh, climate change, but um, Scientists are uh, so much aware of uh, impact of climate change. Uh, sir, at what extent uh, the society aware of these uh, impacts of climate change? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, ma'am, for asking that question. Th that, that is why um, I... I um, uh, I advocate the last uh, section of my talk on, on, on community engagement. Uh, uh, there, there is not much in terms of movement of engaging the community. Yeah. And therefore, one cannot blame the community for not knowing. Uh, uh, the question is uh, 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 probably the majority of our society they are not aware that the things that they are seeing around them are as a result of climate change. And the reason is very simple. Because those who have done the research and they've got the knowledge, they are not going out there, they are not doing enough in, in, in communicating the knowledge that they have. The knowledge that we have, we are not doing enough. 
It's only through the reports. The report is as good as that report. But what about my grandma? What about my uncle uh, who is going to, to clear the, the forest uh, to, to make way for, you know, to grow crops? You know, those are the ones, uh, the farmers who are going to farm and they will say, look, because of the development, I need to go and, 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 and you know, clear the forest here. They have got no knowledge. Uh, 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 I will say probably 90%, I don't have the figures uh, uh, in my head. Somebody who is an expert might, might, uh, might, might, might know. But I will say it's, 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 it's almost, besides the scientists and those that we give information to, I will say the, 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 the rest of the society, they can see events happening, but they cannot really associate them with, 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 with climate change. And when they do, they will say we had that it is associated. And the reason why is because the way we do communication, uh, the way we do community outreach, public engagement, it's a one way stream. We go there to pour information. And in doing so, those people, they will just say the scientists are saying so. But we need the citizen not to, to, to not then pour, end up saying the scientists are saying so but to say, yes, this is actually what is happening. And that can only happen after we have done the proper uh, public uh, science engagement. Shall I ask, thank you so much, sir. Shall I ask one more question, sir? Um, yes, please. My question is, sir, what much can be done by developed nation who were the major contributors of uh, uh, greenhouse gases and uh, devastation of uh, present climate? That, that's very that's very good. So the first thing which we need it's it's the developing nations they, they need strong leadership because they are the ones that bear the brunt most. They have to 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 be united and in, they, they need to come together and impose sanctions on the developed nations. And the way we can do that is we must first find ways for the developing nations to survive uh, uh, without relying much on the developed nations. That's the first thing. Let's, let's, let's as part of the resilient models that we are going to build, we, we, need, we need the developing nations to, to, to start the journey of self-reliance. Um, uh, uh, I, 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 I started my schooling under the tree, yeah, yeah. So you can have education under, under, under the tree, yeah. But then you will see that the, the developing nations are going to the developed nation to say, we want to be like you. It should not be like that. We need to have a sustainable development plan of ours. And we said we need support on this uh, development plan. Because otherwise, the, 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 the developed nations will be happy to make sure that whatever development in the, uh, 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 the developed nations will be happy to support unsustainable development in developing nations. And, and we will not win this, 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 this cycle. And our plea, and especially scientists, and you can see that the, the new recommendations, which I like most, is that of a transdisciplinary one. We can no longer wait for answers from the developed nations. The answers have to be co-created. We need to co-create solutions. Developing and developed nations have to come together. If we wait for the developed nations to come up with solutions, I doubt that we will have a sustainable development for the developing nations. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you for your you're Any other question or participants? If no question, shall we propose okay, one? Okay, ma'am. Uh, one, one more discussion, uh, sir. Uh, I want to discuss one more thing before uh, uh, now. Uh, formal vote of thanks. Uh, this is for my clarification only. We always, we always speak that uh, entire uh, rural world must be aware of uh, this um, climate change issues. But uh, I see 
as a uh, um, person from rural in uh, rural based um, place i i could not i could see there are lot of pollution comes from not from rural based area but it comes the fully avoid affluent society what grassroots problem can be taken to abolish this we are always speaking even in the climatic change conference every uh, nook and corner people at nook and corner particularly in the rural villages should be aware of climate change issue but in fact the major portion of pollution is created by people who live in urban cities and people belonging to affluent society so what do you what is your suggestion regarding this sir so so thank you very much ma'am for that question it's related to the previous discussion uh, oh, okay. yes the, the the poor are the the, the most hard hit as i've demonstrated there they 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 probably contribute 10% to the to the greenhouse emission and the rest of the 90% it's it's caused by the 10% of the rich 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 people or or, or rich rich nations so once again um a a a the 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 poor the poor communities this is why when i do science communication i target poor communities they need first of all to be empowered with a, a, a scientific knowledge they need to be empowered with scientific knowledge yeah that, that's that's very powerful if you empower them with scientific and technological knowledge uh, i think we will address most of the problems because once they they understand uh, 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 who is causing the problems of course they will be able to implement um, uh, 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 their solutions that that's what that's mitigation yeah because because uh, 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 talking to the developed nations that are causing most of the problems uh, uh, i don't think the local villages will 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 will, will, will do that immediately um and number 2 um uh, 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 if 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 we can teach Uh, uh not teach but if we can engage with the villages uh, uh through science communication and 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 empower them in terms of this those mitigation that are are in in the ipcc report as well uh, i think they will be in a in a in a in a in a better state i say that because uh say for example the most most poor communities they are living in the in the lowlands if they had the the, the 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 scientific information they will not wait for for those who are polluting our 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 environment uh, to come and tell tell them that okay it is your own fault that you are living in the lowlands but if scientists can communicate about why most of those villages should not be there and they've got that information in their hands they will start to make alternative plans they will start to take uh, a drastic measures like going to local governments and protest to local governments to say we don't have any way to stay and we cannot stay in this lowlands but they cannot do that because they don't have a reason why when when somebody said why are you sitting and said well there is no other place to stay and this is the place to stay and they cannot see the reason why they cannot stay there because they don't understand the signs behind not staying there and that is that is the least we as scientists could do when we communicate to these these villages but as to as to as to what developed nations could do and what as to what these poor villages uh, could do they can protest whatever they can we know that the developed nations are really just going ahead they are not listening and what we can do as scientists assist local and uh, local communities to pro, to come up with local solutions uh, where they understand the science therefore they will say hmm now we understand uh, and we know that is going to be polluted let us protect ourselves from this uh, environmental degradation that that's 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 the that's that that's what i can i can think of 
I, I don't have a direct sort of, uh, you know, magic solution. But as coming from science, as a scientist, is to engage these communities to be aware for the future and to prepare them to be to be resilient and to be adaptive. Like that, that, that's the, the information that I can I can offer. Thank you for that question. Thank you, sir. Uh, participants, uh, do you have any question? Um, this is the uh, high time, uh, sir. Uh, I am really fortunate to acknowledge the resources of uh, your your speech. Um, it's my great great pleasure um, to acknowledge once again the information shared by our resource person, Dr. Asbindini Murango. Uh, uh, at this juncture, I want to inform all the participants. Um, uh, soon after I place my invitation, he happily accepted our invitation in spite of his uh, hectic schedule. Sir, so your humble beginning and magnificent attainment really to be emulated and it is a great inspiration to all participants, particularly the research scholars and PG students attending your program. So your information on climate change realities, that is the face of destructive climate change, which is more rapid and more intense is heartbreaking. Uh, you mentioned that uh, climate change implication, that is uh, the climate change risk and cascading risk with non-climate change havoc are not worthy to plunge into urgent climate change action. Climate change is a common problem. So collective responsibility is required to abate this unprecedented rate of implication on the society. As stated in the IPCC conference address, we share only one atmosphere and one climate system. It knows no boundaries. It's the high time. And it is the responsibility of all academicians and climate change scientists to provoke the society to deeply aware of climate change risk action. Sir, your strong message that climate change action is multidisciplinary and the need of addressing the issues by all the disciplinary discipline of science. Science and society collaboration is the need of the art that would be the grassroots a solution to eradicate the climate change. And also your mention and your discussion, uh, the role of developed nations in abating climate change is also uh, noteworthy. On behalf of the management of St. Mary's College and all the participants, I extend a hearty thanks for all your resources that you shared, sir. And it's my privilege to welcome, uh, to show my gratitude to our principal, who is always inspiring and uh, motivating to conduct pro programs like this. I appreciate uh, her short and sweet note of felicitation and accepting her wishes for the successful uh, conduction of this program. Once again, behalf of all participants, I extend a hearty thanks to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, dear participants, it is the time for lunch break. We shall meet again at 2 p.m. Uh, thank you all. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, I was a person in touch with you uh, till now. I'm Dr. Glory, head of department. Am I audible, sir? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Glory, sir. 
uh, we, okay. really really we are very happy though you are in magnesian position uh, you have come humbled yourself and uh, gave delivered the point in a simple way so every participants even students can take your valuable thought and they can take into action they can make use of your advice and information to their future career sir thank you so much so much uh, we extend our once again we extend our thanking heart from india so uh, thank you so it was a pleasure it's, it's always good to 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 be talking to uh, our colleagues in india uh, of course to... it's a proud moment for us um thank you thank you so much so next i will communicate through mail sir i will come over by mail okay all right thank you thank, thank you, you very much you, okay. all right bye bye thank you dear participants the feedback link will be shared at the end of the se uh, session Thank you. 
सर शैल वी स्टार्ट द प्रोग्राम गो अहेड आई एम रेडी ओके सर ओके सर ब्यूला मैम शैल वी स्टार्ट ओके गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन वेलकम बैक टू द सेकंड टेक्निकल सेशन ऑफ इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार ऑन क्लाइमेट चेंज एंड फ्यूचर चैलेंजेस ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय मेरियन स्टार सेंटर पीजी एंड रिसर्च डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बॉटनी सेंट मैरीज कॉलेज ऑटोनॉमस तुतुकुडी स्पॉन्सर्ड बाय डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी न्यू दिल्ली आई एक्सटेंड अ जीनियल वेलकम टू द रिसोर्स पर्सन ऑफ द सेशन डॉक्टर दिनेश कुमार श्रीवत्सन होमी बाबा चार प्रोफेसर नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ एडवांस स्टडीज इंडियन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ एडवांस स्टडीज कैंपस बेंगलुरु इंडिया I request Dr. Biola Jalin, Assistant Professor of Botany, to introduce our resource persons to the participants. A very good afternoon to one and all connected here. I am glad to invite you all for the second session of the international webinar on climate change and future challenges, organized by Marine Star Center, PG and Research Department of Botany, Sir Mary's College, Tuttugudi, sponsored by DBT. government of india new delhi i am very pleased and glad to welcome and introduce our distinguished guest dr dinesh kumar shivastava homi baba chair professor national institute of advanced studies bengaluru he hailed as graduate from the ahlabad university in 1970 and he joined the training school at baba atomic research center mumbai and took the variable energy cyclotron project in 1970 and he retired as distinguished scientist and director of variable energy cyclotron center kolkata in 2016 after strenuous effort and dit of hard work for three more years in the department of atomic energy he obtained raja rama fellowship and moved to bengaluru to his credit he is a fellow of national academy of sciences india and in indian national science academy of cyber and recipient of several national and international awards and editorial board member of various journals his academic excellence revealed his visiting position at universities in usa germany canada and south africa He has carved a niche by excelling 170 publications in physics on quark gluon plasma and low energy nuclear physics, 11 books, and has given 450 talks on various themes and outreach, such as prominent personality is amidst us, and we are happy to invite him. Welcome, you sir. I express my special welcome to our promising principal, Dr. Sister Reverend. Sister A S J Luzia Rose and Dynamic Secretary Reverend Sister Flora Mary, and Eminent Head and Associate Professor of Botany Dr M Glory, our Energetic Star College Award Coordinator and Member Secretary Dr Reverend Sister Aruki Janishia Alphonse, and my dear colleagues, I extend my grateful welcome to you all, my dear participants. Once again, I welcome you all for this wonderful session. Over to you, sir. well thank you ma'am for that excellent introduction for your kind words of welcome and let us start you already have had a wonderful lecture from my friend of more than 25 years ajwindini moranga who was the pleasure of first meeting in 1995 and i visited the university of cape town as a visiting professor for a short time he was working for his masters at that time and then we have remained in touch we have collaborated one of my students went to him as a post doc and you have of course enjoyed his lecture i don't to say that okay after such a wonderful lecture my lecture will be a little more elementary i will be talking about climate change and energy options for a sustainable future but before we start let us understand what is a sustainable development by the way my lecture will be at a very ele elementary level so i will write at the beginning 
ask for forgiveness of experts. Okay. <coughs> so the, uh, the let us ask ourselves what, what is uh, sustainable development? A sustainable development is a development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And we, we have already seen that uh, the global warming is going on. And actually, people have called it atlas of suffering. The temperatures are rising worldwide. And greenhouse gases trap more heat in the atmosphere. We are getting early springs, and longer summers. Droughts and floods are becoming more frequent and extreme around the world. Frequent, ferocious, and devastating forest fires are taking place everywhere. Tropical storms are more severe and frequent due to warmer ocean waters. His uh, fishermen are telling that they don't get good catch anymore because they, all the fish have moved colder waters in north and to north and south from the tropical regions. There's less snow in mountain ranges and cooler areas, and the snow is melting faster. We had very hot Siberia, so temperatures of almost 26 degrees centigrade during the last summer. Glaciers are melting all over the world at a very fast rate. The sea ice in the Arctic Ocean around the North Pole is melting faster with the warmer temperatures. Ice in Greenland, Iceland, Antarctica, etc., is also melting in a big way. There's permafrost from Canada, Alaska, Siberia, Tibet, etc., is melting. And as it melts, it releases methane, which is also a powerhouse, powerful greenhouse gas into the air. Sea levels are rising, which will threaten coastal communities and estuarine ecosystems. Coral reefs are dying due to rise in acidity. So th this uh, tells you in a pictorial manner all the, the signatures of warming. Air temperature is rising, glacier volume is decreasing, <coughs> temperature or land is going up, snow cover is decreasing, marine air temperature is going up, sea ice area is decreasing, water vapor in the atmosphere is increasing, sea surface is increasing, sea surface temperature is increasing, the ocean heat content is increasing, the sea level is rising. So areas which are hot are becoming too hot. Areas which are humid are going to become too humid. And areas which are dry today are going to become too dry. And in all this process, countries in the tropics, in particular India and Africa, which have contributed least to the global warming over the centuries, will suffer most. And they are also the poorest, so they don't have the means to face these consequences. So globally, the heat, humidity, and uh, will create conditions beyond human tolerance. The International uh, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change is a group of scientists from all over the world. They have just released their second report about which you heard repeatedly in Ajwindini's talk. And the co-chair, Professor Deborah Roberts, uh, tells that our report clearly indicates that places where people live and work may cease to exist, that ecosystems and species that we have are grown up and that are control, uh, central to our culture and inform us about our language may completely disappear. This is not a very happy situation. Uh, 
So, uh, what will happen for India? In India, what is going to happen is that glaciers in the Himalayas are melting, will melt, and they will lead to extreme water and heat distress in the country. Great Barrier Reef of Australia will die completely. So will the entire ecosystem around it, including whales and dolphins. Africa will go through severe hot and will get extremely hot and it will suffer extreme droughts. North America will have recurring and devastating forest fires and it is already happening. I mean, all these things are already happening. Europe will uh, have extreme heat distress and also tropical diseases like malaria and dengue will now reach Europe. This is a, another study by United Nations and IPCC, which tells you how many people are going to be affected by global warming. If the temperature rises by 1.5 degrees centigrade, right now it has given, gone up by about 1.1 degrees centigrade. Then at 1.5 degrees centigrade, 4,000 million people, that is 400 crore people are going to get exposure to heat, 300 crore people are going to experience severe water stress. There will be risk to power generation to a large number of people. The crop yield will decrease considerably and there will be very great ha habitat degradation. And the temperature goes up to two degrees centigrade, 600 crores will, uh, people will face the stress and if the temperature goes up to 38 degrees centigrade, 800 crore people will feel severe distress. So you can imagine the crisis which has already started. This picture gives you the share of renewables, uh, the energy consumption, global primary energy consumption by source, the down the lowest band tells you what, what was used from biomass. Then the next one gives you coal. The next one is gives you oil. And the other, and the next one gives you natural gas. These are all the fossil fuels, of course, excluding biomass. The little red band is nuclear energy, hydropower, and very small amount. Share of renewables is just about 5%. Nuclear is 10%. Most of it is all global uh, fossil fuel. And it does, this picture here gives you the energy consumption during the year uh, 2020. Yeah. So here what had happened is that uh, coal used was about 35%, gas used was, excuse me, yeah, uh, gas used was 23%, hydro 16%, and uh, nuclear 10%, wind 6%, solar power 3%, etc. If we come to India, then we have thermal power plants which essentially run on coal, producing 75% of the energy. Hydropower plants produce 11% of the energy. Wind, wind uh, energy is 5%, solar is 4%, nuclear is 3%, and others are 2 And this is the energy production last year was just 1598 terawatt hour and we need a factor of four to six times of this energy, but not from coal. We need it from renewable energy and we will talk about it. Okay. But before that, let me just explain to you once again. I'm quite sure that you know what is this problem with greenhouse gases. You see the sunlight uh, hello, um, sir. Sorry for that. Sorry for interruption. Your slide is not moving. 
because of the presence of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide water vapor no2 and methane etc these gases reflect absorb infrared rays and reflect it back to the earth and heat it now if these greenhouse gases are not there all of this heat radiated by earth would have gone back to the atmosphere or to the space and the temperature of the earth would have been minus 18 degree centigrade throughout the year and because of which life would not have evolved so greenhouse gases are important the problem right now is that we have too many of them so and what has happened is that all this has happened because of the rising concentration of carbon dioxide from industrial revolution which is because of the use of fossil fuels so if you look at this red line here that gives you the carbon dioxide concentration and the blue line here is the temperature the temperature is going up the carbon dioxide is going up in fact the rising temperature is now known you don't need any more proof that the temperature is rising because of rising concentration of carbon dioxide during 1850 to 2019 2400 gigatons of carbon dioxide have uh, have been released by human activity and uh, maybe you can do some of your bright students can uh, do it and calculate that 1 ppm of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means 7.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so if it is 2 ppm when somebody says that 419 to 420 ppm then the carbon dioxide has increased by another 8 gigatons yeah but there is another reason to it if you look at prosperity education and life span then these three things can be taken together and converted into what is known as human development index this human development index if it is closer to zero you have absolutely miserable life and and if it is one of course you have heavenly life and this is the human development index plotted against annual energy electricity use per person per year in kilowatt kilowatt hours india uses 1181 kilowatt hour per person and this is where our our human development index is of the order of 0.6 whereas a sustainable and ethical human development index would be obtained if you have something like 4000 kilowatt hour electricity per person available every year and which means that we have to increase our electricity production and availability by factor of 4 and if you are going to get it out of the coal you will have a serious problem much more serious problem than we have right now so coal is definitely fossil fuels are not solved. we have to find out some other uh, sources and we will talk about those now 
In the process analysis, let me just remind you that you look at coal, it emits about 820 uh, tons of uh, carbon dioxide per gigawatt hour. Uh, if you have solar PV, it emits 48 tons of carbon dioxide per, giga, uh, per uh, gigawatt hour. And if you have nuclear or wind, then you have very small, about 10 or 12. And this is the region that the, uh, the sources on this side, solar PV, wind, and uh, nuclear are considered very green sources. So we shall, in the remaining part of the talk, we shall talk about uh, how green are our sources, energy sources, which we are using. We'll talk about bio, biomass or biofuel, hydropower, solar power, wind power, nuclear energy, and I'll just pass through hydrogen energy also, hydrogen also, which is being used this day. Talked about a lot, use is not at very much. Biomass. You can convert wood, food grains, tree, garbage into oil and use it, or you can use, burn it and produce energy. But you need to collect all these things. You need to compact it, and then you need to transport it. This is a very labor and energy intensive process. Also, when you, when you burn all this biomass, you lose nutrients. Same thing happens with biofuel. Where some uh, uh, things like corn or uh, sugarcane uh, is uh, being converted into ethanol. But frankly, first of all, now it is known that biofuels consume more energy than they produce. And secondly, when billions of people in the world are dying of hunger, to convert all this food grain, like corn and sugarcane, into oil so that you can have a, use a car, looks very unethical to me. Hydroelectric power uh, has been used for quite some time. The first hydroelectric power plant in Asia was uh, installed in Darjeeling in 1897. The total install capacity by 2020 across the world is about 30, 30 gigawatts. And IPCC uh, has been suggesting that we can double it by 2050, and I'll tell you, come to it. China right now is the biggest producer of hydroelectricity, 370 gigawatts. Uh, uh, Brazil is 109 gigawatts. India is 50 gigawatt capacity, whereas the uh, the projected capacity of India is about 300 gigawatts, okay? But we have problems. Hydroelectric power is very, very susceptible to droughts. You have more power during the rainy season, and less uh, afterwards, so it is susceptible to seasons. It is susceptible to damp failures. You remember that two years ago in Kerala, many dams had to be opened. Otherwise, there would have been a lot more damage. So if there's too much rain, the dams can fail and create havoc. The dams are also susceptible to earthquakes. The estimates that 40 to 80 million people have been displaced since 2000. 40 to 80 million people, just imagine. It disrupts wild and marine ecosystem. And it disrupts the water flow. The rivers just don't flow anymore. And you know that many fish move up the river, like uh, Hilsa or uh, Hilsa and many other fish move up the river. And they are not able to move. Then in the dams, you have silting because of which reduces the capacity of the dams. Moreover, something which is not very often talked about, when those, those who operate the dams, they know it and they keep record, that there is an evaporation of 5,000 
70,000 liters per megawatt hour. Now, when evaporation takes place, water evaporates, leaves the salt behind. So the remaining water in the dam becomes very salty or saline. And in India, at least, most of the dams also provide irrigation. And if the saline water is going into uh, irrigation, you can imagine what happens. Another thing which only now people have started realizing is that when dams are built, <coughs> a lot of vegetation is submerged. And this vegetation slowly rots in the water, uses up the oxygen because of the fish in the dams die in the lower uh, regions, they die. And it emits methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So here is an example in the two seasons. At one time, it is 94% uh, full. And next year, it is very little full. There is very little water creating severe electrical shortage of power. Let's come to so uh, solar energy. Sun is a very powerful force of energy. It radiates about uh, 3.85 into 10 power 26 watts, 10 to the power 26 watts. It will continue to do so for 5 billion years. The so solar energy is available to us all the time. And this happens because it converts 4.3 million tons of matter to energy per second. And you can calculate that using E equal to MC square formula of Einstein. Yeah. The sunlight, when it reaches the top of the atmosphere, which is about 1300 watts per square meter, but about 30% of it is absorbed by the atmosphere, are reflected, etc., etc. So radiation at some level, just about 1000 watts per square meter in the red band. Others are just absorbed. Okay. So, but solar energy has a problem. Ideally, you should have in the morning, the sun is shining, by noon it is at its height, and then evening it goes down. Of course, during night there is no sun, so there is no solar energy. But in real practice, you will have uh, variations like this because there may be clouds, there may be uh, overcast skies, it may rain, and then the production goes down. And a place like Calcutta, where I spent the last 40 years of my life, the rains can continue for three, four, five days, and you will not have any, any sunlight, and therefore no, no electricity either. If you look at this distribution of solar radiation across the world, then this, uh, you, this is the, uh, the red portions are very hot, the yellow portions are less hot, and then you have much colder regions. And if you just look at this, uh, you can hope, hopefully you can see these black dots here and there, right? Here, 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 here. If you just cover that much area by solar panels, you will have produce enough electricity to meet the entire energy needs of the world, which is 30, 18 terawatt electric uh, at the moment. Okay. And because of this, there has been a tremendous increase in the global solar PV capacity. PV means photovoltaic. So for example, in 2000, there were only 1.3 gigawatts of electricity for uh, capacity. And by now, 2020, it has risen rapidly. And by 2020, it is 770 gigawatts. And in fact, projections are also much better much higher, you can see Northern America, Asia, projections are running from about 1,700 to almost 5,000 gigawatts. So future of solar power is going to be very bright. People are going to use more and more solar power. But let us not forget that intermittent clouds 
And if you just take four grams of dust and spread it over one square meter of meter, then there is 40% reduction in the efficiency of the solar power. So you need <coughs> to keep cleaning them. And for that, you will need water. You also need to keep, keep them cool for higher yields. You need vast area of land, which is not very often realized. You will need five acres per megawatt, five to even 10 megawatts, uh, 10 acres per megawatt. The efficiency of solar panels goes down by 1% every year. So in about 15 to 20 years, you will have to completely replace all your solar panels. And very soon, millions of tons of solar panels will be produced as e-waste with toxic materials like lead and cadmium that will be thrown around. And we have no plans, no known method also to recycle it so far. You need, because it is so intermittent, it is so variable, you will need to have battery or pumped up hydro or storage at heat or as compressed air or as green hydrogen, I'll talk about it. For making the solar panels, you need to use a lot of rare materials. And it uses a lot of material. And harmful chemicals like hydrogen fluoride is used during production of silicon. And people have started complaining that since 85% of the energy falling on solar panels gets radiated as heat, the neighborhood of solar panel area, solar farms gets hot, okay? Also, if you look at the importance of clean energy and uh, the, the things which are very important like uh, rare earths, these are becoming, they, these are also very, uh, very scarce. And the real problem is that half of the world's cobalt reserve is in Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. All your, tele all your mobile phones use cobalt. All the batteries will use cobalt. But half of world's cobalt reserve is in Democratic Republic of Congo. Half the lithium is in Chile. And 70% of rare earths used in wind turbines and electric motors are in China. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Children as young as four are made to work in cobalt mines. I don't think that it is a very happy situation, right? There's another way of doing using solar power that is called concentrated solar plants. What we do is to use lots of mirrors to concentrate, uh, to focus the light onto, a heat, onto some container which may have some special kind of oil, which is heated and can run a turbine. A lot of industries use electricity to generate heat. So instead of going through turbines, if we can use the heat directly here, that can be very valuable. One of the things is the mirrors are much cheaper than solar panels and last much longer. You just have to clean them. There is no need to replace them ever. They may break, but uh, that's pretty soon. But there is a problem is that the birds can get caught in these reflected sun rays and they get incinerated. But still people have gone ahead and they're setting up in desert areas like uh, in Morocco or in Rajasthan, uh, concentrated solar plants are being put up. And this is one such concentrated solar plant of 500 megawatt in Morocco. Wind energy is one of the cleanest renewable sources of energy because it has no greenhouse emission except at the time of manufacture and installation. You need to maintain it only occasionally. These have life to a span of about 30 to 50 years. Do not occupy any space as rotors are at a height of 50 meters or more. So the ground below can be used for cultivation and in Tamil Nadu, 
there were lots of uh, turbines were put up at one time. I don't know whether they're working or not. But you, because wind is not constantly blowing, right? Except if you go to sea, you will need batteries or you can convert it into hydrogen. Okay, the wind energy is also being, uh, wind turbines or wind farms are being produced and installed all over the world at a very large scale in 96, so just six gigawatts. And now it has risen to 650 uh, gigawatts or more. Okay. So this is going to pick up in a big way. But let us not forget some things. These are extremely intermittent and noisy. You need about 20 acres of land to have capacity of about uh, one megawatt. Then, which is limited to hilly terrains, ridges, and also, uh, before I went to Bombay, I had never seen a hill growing up in Allahabad. Nearby, there are no hills. It's absolutely flat. And there, the winds are not very strong. I mean, they are there during, during a storm or something, but not otherwise. The people have complained that there are local warmings. It is killing birds up to more than 5,000 per year in USA alone. And when the, when the turbines move, they, they flicker the light behind them, sunlight, which disturbs animals and can give epileptic fit to people. Installation can be very expensive because 50 to 100 meter long and extremely heavy rotors must be carried to hilly terrains and oceans needing construction of sturdy roads and foundations. Extremely vulnerable during storms, recycling is still in infancy. It is again best with hydrogen uh, battery or with hydrogen generation. So this is the epileptic fit and the, the flickering of lights, which I told, and birds being killed by uh, turbines. And here I give, tell you something. Using artificial, now you can see approaching birds and stop the turbines. So good signs can avert many dangers. Now consider nuclear energy. Consider the nuclear fission of uranium undergoing fission with under the impact of neutron, and it produces 200 million electron volts of energy. And the corresponding chemical reaction, carbon burning, carbon plus CO2 going O2 going to CO2 produces just 4.1 electron volts of energy, which means that fission, nuclear fission reaction, produces up to 50 million times more energy per reaction. And that immediately explains to you why it is becoming so, it, it is so popular and so variable. This is the thing which is holding in, in this, what do you call it, force or tongue, is one nuclear fuel element and it as much, it produces as much energy as 1000 kilograms of coal or 500 cubic meter of natural gas or 450 liters of oil. You can imagine how, how uh, important it is. Now, if you have a nuclear power plant, it will generate power whether there is rain or sunshine or strong wind or snow, it is continuously working. Unlike solar power plant uh, or a wind turbine. Okay? So because of these reasons, there are, these are number of operational nuclear reactors in 2020 by by country, 96 in USA, 23 in India, about 15 in Ukraine, 58 in France and all. And this is the energy supply or energy share of different countries by nuclear power. France produces most of its energy using nuclear power plant, 70% uh, of its energy. And because of that, France is completely immune to these daily fluctuations of uh, oil and natural gas prices. India produces just 3% of 
if India were having a large part of its energy being produced from nuclear power, we would not have been hostess to these uh, fluctuations in, in uh, prices of petrol and oil. Okay. Not only that, the energy during last supply during the last year was 2.55 billion gigawatt hour, 10%. And it averted release of 2 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide during the year. So if it was the, the aversion of, uh, if it stopped 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide from emitted in one year, you can imagine how much carbon dioxide has been stopped from going into the air year by year by year, and how much more it could have done. Fortunately, nuclear reactors are being set up in a large way. ACR 250, out of that, 150 are in China alone, Europe, North America, reactors are being picking up once again, okay? And there is a possibility that we can use thorium, of which there is vast reserves, and especially India has one of the largest reserves of thorium in the world. And then we shall have uh, fuel, which can last us several thousand, tens of thousands of years. So you will never have any problem. But we should also remember that solar power plants use huge amount of materials, cement, concrete, steel, glass, etc. Hydropower plants use huge amount of concrete for the same amount of power compared to nuclear, which is, uses very little, very small amount of concrete and very small amount of steel compared to solar or hydro or wind and even geothermal. So this thing is often not told. Another thing is something called capacity factor. <coughs> capacity factor means is like if you have a plant of 1000 megawatt, how much energy you are likely to get over a period of time on an average. So if you look at nuclear power plant, you will get 93% of its capacity. It means that if you have a 1000 megawatt, you will get 940 megawatt on an average over a period of time. If you have a core power plant, you will get about 48, 480 megawatt. If you have solar plant, you will have only 250 megawatt. So 24 efficiency. And similarly with wind. This thing is not often remembered. And therefore, because now, coming back again, we need to build huge batteries and batteries use lithium and producing lithium, you need to use 2.3 million tons of liters of water per ton for extraction of lithium. Okay, 2.3 million liters of water per ton of lithium. And it releases hydrochloric acid because of which the atmosphere around the environment gets disturbed. These have limited life. Recycling is very expensive, but perhaps it, it can be done. It, it will have to be done. You need pumped up hydro. I'll explain it in the next one, but that is not available everywhere. You can store the, the power as a hot scrap metal or even as a stone. You can heat stones when there is power and use these stones to produce electricity, hot stones to produce electricity. And then you can have a, <coughs> a hydrogen production. I will explain very quickly, very briefly. Okay. So, yeah, the, these things I have already told, so I will not go through it. This is the pumped up hydroelectric battery, and there is extra power. You can pump the water up, and when there is less power, you can let the power flow down and produce energy. And this is going to be fed up at various places in India, wherever it is possible. But let us come to hydrogen, which is being discussed in a big way. 
because if you burn up hydrogen, you get only water, which is very green. And there are several kinds of uh, hydrogen. One is called black hydrogen, which is produced from uh, gasification of coal and produces 16 and half kilograms of carbon dioxide for one kilogram of hydrogen. And therefore, it is called black hydrogen. It's gray hydrogen, which can use methane gas to uh, produce hydrogen and it produces about 5.5 kilograms of carbon dioxide per one kilogram of hydrogen. So you may have get one kilogram of green hydrogen, I mean hydrogen, which is essentially green, but in the process of producing one kilogram of hydrogen, we are producing five and a half ton kilograms of carbon dioxide. You can also have what is called blue hydrogen uh, that you produce Hydrogen from uh, uh, hydrogen by using all kinds of this carbon, but carbon dioxide you deposit somewhere where it, it stays permanently. But this method is not a foolproof, and people have opposed it. It's a very interesting hazard process. Details are not known because it's still a uh, industrial process, patented details are not known, but they claim that they can convert, take methane and convert into carbon and hydrogen, and that carbon can be used. Yeah, it's like here. It's also called molten metal pyrolysis, and this become very, very promising. <coughs> Green hydrogen is the hydrogen where you use electrolysis to produce water, uh, hydrogen, but the power is obtained either from wind energy or from solar PV or from nuclear power. Nuclear power, you have seen, is very, uh, very green. There's another hydrogen called pink hydrogen. And uh, there is a new design of reactors which operate at about uh, 1200 degrees centigrade or 1500 degrees centigrade. And if you get those kind of nuclear reactors, you can very easily produce using the heat, uh, produce hydrogen in a very, very clean, very green manner, and it's called pink. Okay, so COP26, uh, which took place in uh, November, it came to this conclusion that right now we have a 1.1 degree of warming. The, crossing the two degree threshold will put about 1 billion people under extreme heat stress. Bleach or 99% of coral reefs, double the extinction of plant species, and intensify the melting of sea ice in summer by 10 times. It will, uh, it will be fueling up to six meters of sea level rise in vulnerable part of the world. If the sea level rises by six meters, you can imagine what will happen to coastal regions of Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Chennai. Uh, Bombay, Gujarat, etc. Uh, Goa, carbon dioxide emissions must be reduced by 45% to reach the net zero around mid century. Phase down of coal power and phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. 137 countries have agreed to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 20 let us think of something else. The sun is always shining somewhere or other. And we have day here, it is night in the US. The wind is also blowing strongly somewhere or other. There is enough water in hydroelectric dams somewhere or other. So if we can produce all these things, and the, the power plants are connected through a grid, international grid, you can have a very beautiful situation where you place nuclear power plants at best locations away from human habitation under some international safeguards. And then you have an international grid with about 30% base load from nuclear power and the rest connected through international rest of the inner power coming from sun, solar energy and wind energy. But because they are now connected all over the world, the intermittency is gone. 
and there is no need for battery. A bat need for battery is reduced considerably. It can take care of intermittency and it can eliminate global warming for good. And it can also provide enough power for third world countries to rapidly lift themselves out of poverty and dissuade them from deforestation and use of polluting fuel. This will ask, uh, they should set up international grid and provide sustainable, green, clean, and reliable power to cars. And that is what was called, called One Sun, One World, One Grid Initiative by India, which is now known as International Solar Alliance of 140 countries, including UK, Germany, and USA. And this international grid is a very old concept. What Winston Fuller had suggested it way back in 1981 that we can have international grid and uh, use the power uh, very effectively. So looking ahead, climate change cannot be tackled by one country alone. All the countries have to work together. Supposing India alone does all these things. It is not enough because uh, other countries are also producing huge amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, so we are looking forward to have international collaboration in more efficient fuel cells and storage and turbines, a very efficient worldwide web of electricity, a fast linear technology for nuclear energy, and if the fusion technology comes up, which is we uh, tried out at uh, ITER. It will be a fantastic thing that there could be international autonomous body for research and revolution of computers. Right now, the earth is somewhere at this point. If we don't do anything, it will fall into this ditch, which is very hot house earth, from which it may take thousands of years to come out. And in any case, if we fall in that, uh, most of the world population will suffer and die. But if you take corrective actions, we can stabilize the temperature and we can still save the earth. Okay, there is a, as we repeatedly say, there is a, still a brief window to avoid the very worst. This is the decade of action. The future depends on us and not the climate. Climate cannot decide our future. We should decide our future. And if we follow these steps which are being uh, advised, many things will be taken care of and you will also have enough help. And several of these things have been discussed in these two books which we have written, Climate Change and Energy Options for Sustainable Future, and another one which will come out very soon, Art and Science of Managing Public Risk. And it may be useful if you get them for your library because these are written in a very, very simple manner for young students. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you, sir, for the detailed presentation. Yeah. Uh, dear participants, it is the time to discuss your doubts with the resource person. Now you can ask your doubts directly or unmuting your mic. Or you can share your questions in the chat box also. Can you do something so that the sharing can be stopped? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. Please. Now I can see. Hello. 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 Yes. Hello. 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 Yes. Hello. There are some chat. Are there questions in the... Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. My question, actually. Uh, scientists um, already addressed the utilization of renewable energy and availability of energy resources decades back. What constraint uh, that uh, is not realized yet? Uh, ah, wonderful question. You see, for using real... Uh, real this energy, renewable energy, you have to make solar panels, you have to install them, you have to 
the energy, the electricity which is produced is at a very low voltage. You have to convert it into high voltage. Then you have to convert it to alternating current, etc. Et Whereas coal is very cheap, very dense form of it. Because coal is available and it is very cheap, people have been ruthlessly, relentlessly using coal. Also, because not many people were going for renewable energy, there was not much research. So there was not enough efforts to make them cheaper, make them more efficient. That has started only now and it has shown results only now. So the reason was that coal was available, petroleum was available, the, the gas has been available, and which are very cheap and very concentrated form of energy. Nothing else, it is our laziness and our greed. Is that clear? Uh, you, you mentioned uh, in your lecture, it is new information for me, uh, that uh, solar radiation input, we know in, we have, uh, we are near the equatorial uh, climate, we have solar radiation uh, uh, resource uh, that we know, yet uh, I came to know there are some black spot you mentioned, um, that the area can supply uh, the energy, necessary, uh, meet the energy requirement of the whole world, if super international grids are constructed, what constraint is there financial difficulty or lacking of understanding between countries? Well, definitely it will require uh, laying down of cables and all, but almost all countries already have grids, right? India already has a grid supplying power to Nepal, to Bhutan, but it is our supply is only 4% of the energy requirement through renewable resources, no? Yeah, uh, but but it, legally, it, it, has, it, it has to go up, right? Now, the coal consumption, coal production in India is 75%. The energy Possibly. produced from coal is almost 75%. All that has to stop and it has to come from renewables. So it has to, and it has to be done very quickly. Government of India is doing quite a lot, but people have to adapt very quickly. Otherwise, we are going to be in very serious trouble. There is a huge number of climate refugees. Millions of people will have to move away from their home. Entire central India will be extremely hot, unlivable. So uh, this has to be done. Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the detailed presentation. Uh, now I request Dr. M. Glory, had been Associate Professor of Botany to deliver oath of thanks. I'm extremely happy uh, for presenting an elaborate lecture on sustainable source of energy, uh, uh, the scope and uh, uh, the explanation on scope of uh, renewable energy resource available in the country is uh, 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 somewhat soothing to our mind. Even if uh, loss of uh, fossil fuel happens, uh, we can sustain uh, our life because of availability of large resources. Sir, the delivery of point by you is so very informative. Your emphatic presentation must, must have made more impact and take home value for the participants. Thank you so much for your uh, um, elaborate presentation, sir. Um, thank you so much, sir. On behalf of the management and botany department, wholeheartedly extend thanks once again. Thank you so thank much, sir. You. Dear participants, the feedback link has been posted in the chat box. Kindly pull it. We shall meet tomorrow at 9 a.m. The meeting link already has been provided with the invitation. Hello, sir. I will meet you over uh, mail. Okay, thank you so much.
Once again, we thank you all. We will meet tomorrow at 9 a.m. sharply. Thank you.